Well, it's good to see all of you here. And um, as you know, we have a gigantic physical architecture in place that um, is ready to destroy the entire planet. And um, as Aaron said, these things can be used by accident or they can be appropriated by terrorists or by a rogue state but uh, they are put in place by the nation states, and it is the nation state architecture that we need to dismantle. Um, the architecture is, involves uh, arsenals that are 94% owned by two countries, the United States and Russia. Uh, the small wedge of missiles that you see up around one o'clock, those are missiles owned by the other seven nuclear states. And um, this, this physical architecture has a mental architecture that goes along with it that involves false beliefs and things like deterrence. It involves, it depends on the passivity of, and the infantilization of the population. It, it couldn't stay in place if the population would wake up about it. But the main thing that we're talking about today is the way in which the, there's a contrast between this architecture and the architecture of civilization. And all of us are familiar with uh, what the landscape looks like when even a small nuclear weapon is detonated. This is Hiroshima, it's a, a theater uh, in Hiroshima. Um, and this was a, a tiny fraction of any one of our missiles. So for example, our Ohio-class submarines each carry the equivalent of 4,000 Hiroshima bombs. We have 14 Ohio-class submarines. We're making 12 new ones. Um, we can do the math. They, they, it's enough to destroy, um, as Aaron and, and Jonathan said many times over, the Earth. But part of our focus is the way in which these weapons um, not only destroy uh, the civilization once they're detonated. And, and let me stress that some of my students and colleagues sometimes say a missile launch is hypothetical, it's suppositional, it's in the future, it's abstract. That may be true. What is not in the future is that the arsenal is in place and that of the thousands of steps required to set this up, all but one step has taken place and all you need is that last step. Those steps are not hypothetical. They're there, they're there right now. We don't see them, but we're there. Anyway, the way in which this erodes the architecture even before that final step is taken is part of our subject and why Jonathan has called this Minds Not Missiles. Here's the report given by the American Society of Civil Engineers on the state of our bridges. This is their most, their 2017 report. Uh, we were given a C plus on bridges. We have 614,000 bridges in this country and four out of 10 of them, so close to half of them, are over 50 years old. From the point of view, view of engineers, this is a problem because the design life of structures is usually taken to be 50 years, and four out of 10 of them are more than 50 years old. The cost of bridge repair, they estimate, is 123 billion. And you can find much more information on each of these on, on their website, but I just wanna quickly run through it. Roads, they give us a D. Uh, they say that one of five miles of highway pavement in the United States is in bad condition. In Cambridge, I think it's one in one uh, <laughs> uh, highway pavement. Um, I, it's bizarre if you go to Switzerland or you go to c other countries with har harsh climates, Sweden, Norway, uh, the roads somehow are intact. Uh, and it's, it's not through lack of goodwill, it's through lack of something else. At any rate, the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers points out that the fatality rate on traffic was dropping year after year, uh, and then in 2014, the shift from 2014 to 2015 suddenly increased, jumped by 7%, and they attribute that to the condition of the, um, of the roads. Our favorite subject of transit, uh, D minus, this gets the lowest grade they give. Um, they say that it's just based on an aging infrastructure. It would require $90 billion to um, rehabilitate this, and each year uh, it's, it's getting worse. Um, schools, they give us a D plus, and note that 24% <clears throat> of the public schools, and so that's close to a quarter of the public schools, they gave a rating to of fair or poor, so either, and, and they're talking about the, the structures 
of the schools, either a fair, that's a C, or a poor, that's a D, um, in their quality. And then public parks, they give a D plus to uh, because the public parks do require a lot of infra infrastructure. I won't go on with all of them. I just put a summary here. Our ports, we got a C plus. The country has 926 ports. Our inland waterways, we got a D. The country has 25,000 miles of inland waterways with 239 locks. And uh, most of our dams are well past the 50-year design life. Our levees, the country, as you can read up there, um, and this is again taken from their website, has 30,000 miles of levees that protect many structures. I just listed the one that's dear to many of us, colleges and universities. 300 colleges and universities will go if those levees aren't protected. A bill has been passed to protect the levees, but they haven't been given any funding because we know where the funding is, is going. So that's all from the point of view of, um, of engineers. And I just want to say that from the, and, and by the way, these engineers, as far as I know, don't have a specific focus on nuclear weapons as we do. They're not, they're not trying to address nuclear weapons. They're just saying, we are in trouble. This is a wealthy country, and we are in trouble. So too, with economists, I last week went to a lecture by uh, the Piketty, I always pronounce it Piketty, but I learned at the lecture he pronounces it um, Piketty, who wrote Capital in the 21st Century about inequality and the huge divide between richest and poorest. But just one of his figures I thought caught my attention for the purposes of this conference, and that is that all those lines up at the top are just talking about the public wealth of various countries, and we're the blue, and we're on private wealth more or less rising. The bottom lines represent not private wealth, but public wealth. There are two countries that are below zero, and it's the United States and the United Kingdom. And that is the result of deficit spending. Um, and it's out of that public commonwealth, the, the word commonwealth, like the commonwealth of Massachusetts, means the commonwealth, the wealth we hold in common. And we are now um, below zero because of the deficit spending, and yet it's out of that shared public wealth that we can rebuild ourselves. Um, one of my colleagues at Harvard, Jerry Green, points out this important fact that I hadn't been aware en uh, enough aware of, and that is that the federal government is permitted to carry out deficit spending. Local and state governments are not permitted to carry out deficit spending. They're constitutionally required to balance the budget. So when the schools and the roads and the dams and the levees can't be paid for by the federal government and have to be repaired by local, they, it, it will have to be done through taxes. So not only are we paying national taxes to pay not for schools and roads and things we care about, but for missiles, um, but then we're going to be also asked to pay again uh, because we need to repair our roads and we need to repair um, our schools. Anyway, um, this back to our own architecture, and of course the key thing from my point of view is the fact that you not only have these weapons that can annihilate every species on Earth, but this is all can be launched by a single person, by the president in our country or by the equivalent in the other nuclear states, because nuclear weapons are designed to be used by a small number of people. So that's outrageous. But it happens that we also have a, a remedy for that, which many of you have heard me talk about before, and that is that our own constitution has two breaks on it that are absolutely incompatible with that kind of out-of-ratio weaponry. One constitutional break is the requirement for a congressional declaration of war. Um, the second one, I won't go into a lot, although I, it's very important to me, and that is the Second Amendment uh, that basically says, however much injuring power your country has, whether you opt to have zero or you opt to have a huge arsenal, it's got to be e equally distributed among every citizen so that each person is the guardian over their piece of it. That's what the right to bear arms means, despite the obscene way it's come to be misunderstood. Um, but the, the one that we have the best chance with is the Congressional Declaration of War. And if this seems like sometimes some people say to me this is a small sort of legalistic issue. No, this is not a small legalistic issue. 
This is how citizens can put their hand on the lever and dismantle this whole architecture. Because once you show that you can't have it done by a single person, the whole thing begins to unravel. Um, and you, you have the grounds for disassembling the whole um, arsenal. At any rate, the Congressional Declaration of War is key because if you look at the contrast between um, those five cases where we've had a constitutionally mandated declaration of war, which is the War of 1812, the War of 1846 with Mexico, the War of 1898, the Spanish-American War, and World War I and World War II, and you look at those deliberations, you see that it has features that are nothing in common with what happens when a presidential council talks about war. And, in, in the, and my basis for saying that is looking at uh, Eisenhower papers, uh, as well as the Cuban Missile Papers, uh, Eisenhower papers when he contemplated dropping the atomic bomb in the Taiwan Straits in, in 54, and then again in 59 in Berlin. There, my, my time's up now? Okay, let me, let me just stop and say that, um, as you all know, we have a, uh, a, a, a remedy at hand, which is the Marky Lou bill, um, and the, it currently has 13 co-sponsors in the Senate, 59, 79 in the House. Um, it is, seems like a imaginative but unrealistic solution. No, it is a realistic solution. Even the uh, hard-nosed New York Times, which is not usually sympathetic to nuclear issues, has endorsed it as early as February of last year and keeps endorsing it. Um, but it can't happen unless we, uh, unless we call, uh, and not, not just email, but call our representatives. And some of you are here from other states, Jersey and New York State, where the proportion of uh, representatives is, is equally bad and where people really need to be on the phone because a phone call from President Trump or the executive in one of the other countries can begin to annihilate the earth um, and a phone call from any one of us can begin to undo that whole architecture. So I hope I have sheets with the numbers for people in Massachusetts for you to call. If you're really committed to making a phone call, I will please come to me and I'll, I'll give you a sheet. Thank you. Yeah, it, 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 the, since the invention of nuclear weapons, we've stopped having a congressional declaration of war. And what we've had instead are exactly these kinds of authorization of force, which is a very different uh, kind of, of mechanism. Uh, the Congressional Declaration of War is a very hard thing to get past. You have to have over 500 people um, debating on it and then coming up to the microphone and saying yes or no. Everyone understands exactly what they're, what they're authorizing. Even in uh, the beginning of the, the first Gulf War um, under the senior Bush president, um, we had only a conditional declaration of war, which in the actual declarations of war was always said to be illegitimate. Because the whole point of it is, if you're actually going to start massacring people, you better take responsibility for it and say, I put my name to it. I stand behind it. And if instead what you say is it's conditional, uh, we're not exactly declaring war, we're saying if such and such events don't come into place by such and such a date, we will be at war. No. That was always looked on as shabby, morally shabby. Um, but the presidents, once they had this power to um, annihilate people by picking up the phone, and as Nixon said, in 25 minutes, 70 I can pick up the phone and 70 million people will be dead. Once they had that power, the idea of going into this unwieldy congressional structure just seemed preposterous. And so we have the elder Bush saying, I didn't have to go into Congress and get some old goat's permission uh, to take uh, Saddam Hussein out of, out of Kuwait. Um, but that is, that is disastrous because in designing the Constitution, um, it was specifically an obstructive act. Uh, Congress didn't want to obstruct going to the library. It didn't want to obstruct going to the hospital. It didn't want to obstruct making love. It wanted to obstruct one thing, war. Um, and that, over thousands of years, the whole idea of social contract was 
developing something that puts an impediment in the way of going to war. So your, your question is a very important one. There shouldn't be shortcut methods. And also when people say, well, let's instead have a committee. No, it was not meant to have a committee. Um, again and again, the, uh, the people writing the Constitution said it had to be the largest possible body. Um, so, does anyone else? <laughs>